Good morning. If you'll please take your hymnals in preparation for our processional hymn, number 368, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Again, 368, please stand in body or spirit. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a joy to be in worship with each of you this morning. If you are one of our guests, we hope that you feel particularly welcomed here in the house of the Lord, in the presence of Christ as we've gathered to worship his holy name. We have pew pads available at the end of each pew aisle. If you would please take one of those and give us a record of your attendance. If you're one of our guests, please let us know how we might be in touch with you throughout the week so that we can contact you about our ministries here. If you have any questions about the mission and ministry of our church, please do not hesitate to reach out to one of us as pastors or to find someone in the narthex and to ask questions about uh, what's going on in our congregation. We do list several announcements for you on the back of your order of service. If I would, I would like to highlight just a few of those for you. This Tuesday, we will have our United Women in Faith monthly meeting in the parlor. You can see information about that. This Wednesday, we will have our Lenten lunch. These Lenten luncheons have been uh, great successes, a lot of fun. We've had two so far. This Wednesday, in the Fellowship Hall, beginning at 1130, lunch is served. The program starts close to noon so that you can take uh, your lunch hour to come. We have Nate Patterson. He's a ministry leader here in Dothan, the executive director of Time Youth Dothan. This is probably the most important ministry for Jesus Christ and our middle schoolers in the Dothan area that's happening right now. Nate is uh, running this ministry, helping take care of young people in our community and raising them for Christ. We would uh, love for you to come and hear about his ministry and hear the message that God has given him to share with us. That's this week in the fellowship hall during the lunch hour. You do not need a reservation to come. We hope you will uh, join us. Then Thursday evening, March 7th at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall is our men's night of worship. All men are invited uh, to attend this great evening. Chris Hogan, an inspirational and world-class athletic leader uh, in, in really the world, uh, will be joining us uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday night at 6 o'clock. We'll have excellent meal and an outstanding speaker and night of worship. I hope that you can join
join us this Thursday for our first, which will likely be an annual event, Men's Night of Worship. You'll see other opportunities listed there in the back of your order of service. I will say if you're a part of our youth group or have youth in your family and want to know more about this summer's mission experience to Honduras, please reach out to Robbie. He needs to know our youth director by March 15th um, if there is a student in our congregation or community that would like to join them. This trip is also available to our college students. So please uh, make every effort to contact him about that before March 15th. Again, it is a joy to be in worship with you this morning. As you are able, would you please stand for our call to worship, affirmation of faith, and Gloria Patri. <clears throat> Everyone who thirsts, all who are hungry for righteousness, all who need the help of God, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. pastors here and it is my joy to be with you this morning in worship um, especially as we come into this time of prayer uh, I, I want to say that we really want to be in prayer with you and there are a lot of ways that we can do that there are prayer request cards throughout the sanctuary you can fill one of those out and put it in the offering you can also submit those online or you can always talk to one of the pastors uh, we are uh, willing and want to be in prayer with you as we encounter all sorts sorts of things throughout our lives. Today we remember and uh, our Christian love and sympathy go to Gail Kelly and Belinda Benefield and family upon the death of their mother, Alice Allred, who died February 29th. And then we uh, offer in prayer Thomas Wheatley, who's in the hospital in Pennsylvania, and Don Swanson, who is in the hospital in Emory in, jo in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we continue to hold them in our prayers. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. So we'll... Thank you. We'll also add Pat Smith, and we'll continue to hold her in prayer upon a fall this earlier this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, you are the creator of the universe, the one who set the stars in the sky and took the dust of the earth into your hands and carefully formed each of us, knowing us down to the number of hairs upon our head. Out of your love, you have offered each of your children the cup of salvation, even though we have rebelled against your love and failed to be an obedient people. Still, your grace reaches through the barriers and breaks down walls and does not leave us to the slavery of sin. Help us now, O oh Lord, to follow your son Jesus more closely 
as we cling to your rod and your staff to be led out of the shadows and into the comfort of your light, the comfort of your presence in this world. We pray for peace in our world and for the joy of your glory to be known and celebrated by all. May your spirit dance in our souls that we may be stirred within in new strength and energy, knowing that you are alive in us. And we have the opportunity to shine your light with our every breath and your abundant love. We receive healing and hope for your kingdom is coming and we can taste the goodness of your love. So with grateful hearts, we praise your name. Amen. Several years ago at Princeton University, all of the research students who were beginning their year had their annual welcome, and there was a, a plenary of professors in front of them, and uh, one of the research students stood up and asked this question. What is there left in the world for original dissertation research? And the first professor at Princeton University to answer this doctoral student was Professor Albert Einstein. He grabbed a microphone and he said these words, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. During these weeks, we have been exploring the scripture as we do our own research on how to live a more full life of prayer as Jesus' disciples. This morning, we turn to the passage where they said to him, teach us about prayer. To hear Jesus' response, would you please stand out of reverence for him? This is Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. When I was a youngster in Sunday school, I went up to uh, my Sunday school class at my church, and the teacher was uh, trying to keep all of our interest and also teach us a thing or two as young people about prayer. And so I remember vividly her asking the question, what name do you use for God when you're praying? Now, if you've been using the workbook of Living Prayer, which is the Maxi Dunham study that our church, over 200 people, are using this Lenten season, you know that in week one, day seven, this is a question asked for reflection. What is the name you use for God when you pray? Well, back to my Sunday school class, uh, one of the kids said, I always say, dear God, and she affirmed that response. And another said, uh, I use the word father. And another said, I use almighty God. And then she used that opportunity to teach us really what almighty means. And then someone said, I, I pray to Jesus. Is that okay? Of course, that's wonderful. And then I raised my hand and she called on me and I said, well, I sometimes use Jesus's first name. And she kind of proudly looked at me like, oh, we've got a biblical scholar here. And she said, you use the name Yahweh, David? And I said, no, I've never heard of that before. I call God Howard. And she said, what? what? And, and uh, I said, you know, in big church, every Sunday we say our father in heaven, Howard be thy name. I was seven years old before I realized God's first name wasn't Howard. <laughs> Today, we read this prayer that we have named the Lord's Prayer. This prayer that has shaped Christianity for two millennia. This prayer that he gave us teaches us so many things about who God is and who we are in the presence of God that one day we likely will do an entire sermon series just on the Lord's Prayer. 
But in our exploration of how to be better prayers or more fruitful in our praying, more scriptural in our understanding of our life of prayer, I, I want to look at one do, if you will, because last week we did some don'ts, of, of praying. And it's found in line one of this one prayer that Jesus gave us. But we say it so often that I think sometimes the re repetition of saying it has stopped us from being arrested by its power. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here's what the oldest version we have of Matthew's gospel tells us the Greek says. Father of us, the one in the heavens, let be revered and adored the name of you. That word, hagiastheto, that we have in Greek, that Matthew used in his gospel, that Jesus said to his disciples, hagiastheto, we translate now with this medieval term, hallowed, but, but, a, but a real translation of the word used most every other time it's translated in our ancient texts is, let be revered and adored. Let be revered and adored your name is the prayer Jesus taught us. That is the, the do, if you will, of praying. Adoration. Are you including adoration in your daily prayer life? You see, Christ understood that when we worship, it, it tells us just as much about the worshiper as it does about the deity being worshipped. That our worship is actually important and matters how we worship, what we say when we worship, the, the, the disposition that we have when we approach God's heavenly throne, but here on earth. Jesus wanted that attitude, that disposition to be one of joy, one of service, one of praise. This is the attitude that we should use when we approach the throne of God. Christ has taught us in, in the Lord's Prayer, one of the first lessons is that we must adore, adore God in our praying. Finding a, a life of joy and worship is the outcome of living a life of prayer. So that if we develop an active prayer life in our own spiritual practice, the outcome of that will be joy and, and worship of God. So Jesus begins at the goal. He gives us words to use at the very beginning of our prayer so that we know where we're headed with our praying. And that is we begin in worship. We begin in adoration. And like any good meal is made better and enhanced by good and better ingredients, our prayer lives can be enhanced by better ingredients. Last week, uh, we talked about the scriptural practices of supplication. That is a prayer where we beg God to supply our needs. Confession a prayer where we name our sins and pray for repentance. We talked about meditation, a prayer where we are listening for God to speak to us. If, if you weren't with us, you can go back and, and listen to those components or elements of a, of, of a more effective prayer life. This morning is adoration, another effective and essential ingredient to a more robust prayer life. We adore God for who He is. We praise God for his holiness, for his power, for his majesty. Now, God doesn't need our adoration, but we deeply need to adore God. We need to be the kind of people who learn day to day that we have been maybe even created just to glorify and worship God. And so adoration as an act of prayer situates us properly before him every single day of our lives it, it, to focus on his holiness, on his very nature. This is so important that Paul, in his greatest epistle, Paul wrote most of the letters of the New Testament, his greatest one is likely Romans. It doesn't have to be your favorite one. It just has the most meat in it. And it's not really a whole lot of words. I should have counted for this part of the sermon. But he uses several times throughout his epistle to the church of Rome, he uses a pause to adore God. 
right there in the very letter that he's writing. One example is in Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. He could have said God knows all things or God is omniscient. But instead, he's teaching us a prayer of adoration. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That wasn't the end of the epistle to the Romans. He just made a pause for adoration. There's always a dimension of mystery about prayer. When we as creature uh, draw ourselves more fully into the presence of our creator, there is great power at work there. And, and our prayer is an opportunity to actually stand on holy ground, to acknowledge we have uh, tapped into that presence of God that is always available to us. And because we are present, we need to name God's glory and, and to glorify him by naming all of the ways in which we do adore him for his greatness and his goodness, for his love, for his mercy, for, for, for his wisdom, for his care, for his presence, for his power. There are many ways that we can see beyond our own limitations when we are adoring God, when we can tap into that power and mystery that is a strength beyond our own selves. When was the last time in your prayer life you truly gave a moment of adoration, naming God by his very nature, by the revelation of Scripture and Jesus Christ of who God is, have you named that back to Him as a way to continue to shape and teach yourself who God truly is and who we are? It is an attitude of adoration that brings us under and into His presence and His glory and His awesome grace. Maxie Dunham, who wrote the, the, the prayer study we're reading, he says this, when we practice adoration of God in our praying, we gain a healthy perspective of our own time and our own circumstances. I have found, and many others have shared the same experience, that problems are seen in a different light when we are adoring God. Perplexities untangle, I love that, that confusion often vanishes. It's just in the act of adoration that clarity can be given to the, the prayer. That, that the perplexities of life, the complexities of life, seem more clear, seem more uh, approachable and doable when we are adoring God. Maxie says, this is a power unsought and unasked that comes in my praying, and I can give attention and adoration to God knowing that I will never know how this works, but I do know that it works. That the challenges of my life are made less challenging when I'm adoring God. The sorrows of my life are less sorrowful when I'm adoring God. Von Hugel once declared, any religion that ignores the adoration of God is like a triangle with one side left out. Well, I would like to push that a little further and say any human being who lives their life without adoring God is like a triangle with one side left out. We are somehow incomplete. We are not whole if we are not adoring God B because we are a, a people that have been created to worship and adore God. There's this ancient prayer that uh, just has one word repeated three times. Wonderful, wonderful, Wonderful. This is a prayer of adoration. To say to God, for who you are, all I have is the word wonderful. For what you have done for me, wonderful. 
for the way you have loved this world in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of our souls. Wonderful. When we experience the highest highs of our lives, the lowest lows of our lives, the, the mundane monotony of our lives, are we able to look to the heavens and cry, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful and regain that perspective of God's holiness that truly can sustain us through the highest highs and the lowest lows and the everydayness of life. I'm convinced that adoration of God is essential to experiencing the whole of life because it is preparing us for a life that is eternal. You see, when we are adoring God in our praying, we are the most like we will be in our eternal existence because the scriptures tell us that in eternity, all will be adoration. All will be glorifying God and Jesus Christ. And so when we take a time in our prayer life to adore God, we have touched that which will be the eternal nature of our being, a life of adoration and praise. There are three kind of elements, if you will, the scriptures give us about adoration. Maybe you could call them the three subdues of the doing of adoration, the, the, the subsets of this prayer. It is gratitude, reverence, and awe. <clears throat> they all kind of work hand in hand together. Gratitude is not only a prayer of thanksgiving for God's gifts, although that is an important part of, of, of prayer life, thanksgiving. Gratitude is thanking God for who God is, for, for the revelation that God has given us in Jesus Christ, for the fact that God took on flesh and came into the world to show you and me how to have a more hope-filled and joy-filled existence. Have we expressed gratitude to God for the gift of the Holy Spirit this day? Have we said thank you to God for being a God who has created us to have this kind of experience? A worship service, like the scriptures declare in the book of Acts, where we come together by the power of the Holy Spirit and unite ourselves in acts of praise and worship in the act of prayer and the word being proclaimed, that the Holy Spirit might be made better known in my own life and in your life. Have we thanked God for that today, for all he is and all he is doing? Again, God doesn't need our gratitude, but thanksgiving is an opportunity for us to be molded by our prayer life to become the one who is grateful for the holiness of God, for God's love, for God's constancy, for God's goodness. How much better each day of your own life and mine would be if I lived in gratitude for the God who is always with me, when I was on my honeymoon, I remember uh, sitting out on this deck that went out into the uh, Caribbean Sea, and, um, and, and I was laying out there for a moment kind of by myself. It was, it was a deck that just Elizabeth and I had access to where we were staying, and uh, I was reading C.S. Lewis, and I, and I know before you start feeling sorry for Elizabeth, she knew she was marrying a nerd. You don't have to feel sorry for her. She knew what she was getting into. And, uh, and it's not that I just sit around and, and read C.S. Lewis all the time or great Christian thinkers, but um, I, I wish that I had more time to do that. So when I am away and, and able to relax, I do find great peace in reading excellent authors, not even their whole works necessarily, just excellent excerpts from excellent authors. And I just happened to be reading um, from C.S. Lewis when all of a sudden I looked over my book and the sun began to set. And, and, and you know you have seen the sun set on water before and how glorious it can be. But you have also been, I'm sure, looking out over the water when the sun has been setting and there is nothing but the splendor of God displayed in the heavens right before our earthly eyes. It was one of those sunsets. The beauty of God was on full display. The glory of God is all any human could ever have reflected upon when looking at this sunset. And do you know what my first instinct was? 
to run away from it. Do you know why? Because Elizabeth wasn't there at that moment. She was inside the room, and I had to share it with her. I had to go get her as quickly as I could. And I ran, and I got Elizabeth, and I brought her out to the deck because I knew this sunset would only be real to me if I could share it with the one whom I loved. It became more glorious and more splendid and more enjoyable if I was able to experience it with Elizabeth. And I knew that life was different now because experiences are only truly enjoyed and and celebrated if I also have the chance to enjoy them and celebrate them and share them with her. This is what gratitude is about with God, the one whom my heart is supposed to long after the most, that I am supposed to love more than anyone or anything else, God. I must be able to share the real blessings of my life with God in such a way that I can truly then enjoy those blessings by having an opportunity to tell God thank you for them. Christ is is teaching us to change our perceptions and, and, and our very lives as we show our gratitude to God for all that he is. After the sunset, I uh, began reading that passage that I was reading from C.S. Lewis again, this time inside. And it was amazing how God's hand was, was right on it. I have it highlighted and starred, and I've written all in the margins about what had just occurred because what C.S. Lewis began to, to talk about in that portion of the book was adoration and the prayer of gratitude. These are his words. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. Do you hear what he's saying? You you cannot really enjoy something until you've told God how grateful you are for that thing. That is the consummation of the enjoyment of it. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it's expressed. It is frustrating to have discovered a new author and not be able to tell anyone how good they are. To come suddenly at the turn of the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur and then to have to keep silent because the people in the car with you think of it no more than a tin can in the ditch. To hear a good joke and to find no one to share it with, Lewis writes, the worthier the object the more intense delight will be. If it were possible for a created soul fully, I mean up to the full measure conceivable in a finite being, to appreciate, that is to love and delight in, the worthiest object of all, and simultaneously at every moment to give this delight perfect expression, then that soul would be in supreme beatitude. To see what adoration really means... We must suppose ourselves to be in perfect love with God. In our praying, become drunk with the love of God. Drown in your love of God. Be dissolved by your love for God. That delight which far from remaining pent up within ourselves as incommunicable, hence hardly tolerable bliss, flows out from us incessantly again in effortless and perfect expression. Our joy no more separable from the praise in which it liberates and utters itself than the brightness of a mirror receives is separable from the brightness it sheds. If, in fact, our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, then we shall know that these are the same thing. To fully enjoy God is to glorify God. Are we doing this in our prayer life? To glorify God is to enjoy God This is what it means to sit before him and to know yourself as created, sustained, and saved, and to be grateful. All the other moments of our life, because we're such busy, important people, we're trying to create things and sustain things and save things. In our prayer life, we kneel in gratitude 
as the one created, sustained, and saved. It is so liberating. The second element of adoration, after we've fully expressed our gratitude and thereby fully enjoyed who God is for us, is the practice of reverence. To be reverent, to, to revere God in our prayer life, isn't really something that, that, that is easy to teach. It's, it's not something to say it ought to happen, because it's really more, I think, of a feeling we um, can hardly contain when we're drawn into God's, the knowledge of God's presence. <clears throat> it's why we, we teach children to fold their hands when they pray, so that there's some kind of physical act of saying, okay, now I'm doing something that's different. I'm somehow being respectful I can't be doing this if I've got my hands like this, first of all, so there's some mechanics to all this. But also, I've, I've stopped. I don't walk around like this or sit like this normally. I'm doing something that should be reverent. It's why some adults continue the practice of kneeling when they pray to create that sense of reverence. I I like to think of a time when I was truly at one with God and could do nothing but revere Him when when I am practicing adoration in my own prayer life. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was responsible for a long time, for about seven years, for the ordination service of the Alabama West Florida Annual Conference of United Methodism. And so each year, because I was the executive pastor at the church where it took place, I would have to plan the, the service. And, and the planning was hard. The execution of it was much more challenging. And, and get everybody ready and in their place and have everything they need to have. And, and, and to do this, it was like a two and a half hour service. And, uh, and, and so I would work for months in preparation. And then the year that I was going to be ordained, people started saying things like, we need someone else to plan the service, even though it's the job of that person at that church that I had, because I was going to be ordained. Well, our church staff also experienced some major transitions that year, and there really wasn't anyone else that could or had the experience of doing my job, and I wanted my ordination service to go well. So I said, I'll just plan it anyway. Forget that I'm one of the ones being ordained. It was a huge mistake. You don't have to be in control of everything, you know what I'm saying? But I didn't know that back then. And so I tried to plan and execute my own ordination service. (laughs) Sounds ridiculous saying it out loud. And so that night, I was uh, outside the sanctuary, putting all the bishops in order, making sure everybody had on the right things and had the right things in their hands and was standing in the right spots in line. And I'd, you know, been practicing this and rehearsing this. And everyone else in my ordination class had been using the weeks leading up to ordination to think about the fact that they were giving their lives over to the church, that they were making a promise to God to, to serve the church with the rest of their lives. And I was just thinking about this one service of worship. It was so frenetic and busy. And then finally, I walked down the center aisle right where I was supposed to, and I sit on the outside aisle of the, of the first pew where the ordinands were sitting. And because I was in charge of the service, I got to sit on the outside aisle because that's the best seat. And, uh, and sitting right next to me was my best friend in my ordination class, Lonnie Pittman. Some of you might remember Lonnie. He served here. We're great buds. And, and as I was sitting there, I was still just, just working, you know, making sure everything was happening like it was supposed to. Then the choir stood up to sing the anthem that had been prepared, and I had asked them to do a piece that's ridiculously hard, but they never acted like it because they wanted to do their best, and, and they wanted to give this gift to me since it was the one I picked. It's Mac Wilberg's arrangement of Come Thou Fount, and when they sang that first line, which is really sung almost a cappella, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, suddenly it hit me what was happening, where I was, whose I was, and before whom all the secrets of my heart had been disclosed, and that I was about to give my whole life over to him and his church, and that this is a fount of every blessing. And friends, I melted into tears. I was so thankful that I was facing the choir, two of whom couldn't finish the anthem because of how wretched I looked in my crying. The rest of the congregation, praise be to God, couldn't see me. 
Lonnie looks over and puts his arm on me and says, are you okay? And, and I said, I'm fine. I'm going to be okay. And then uh, the, the song continues, and I just keep, I'm, I'm wailing. I mean, I, I can barely hold in the feelings I had because of the reverence of that moment and the feeling of being at one with a God who is a God of every blessing. And, and Lonnie puts his arm around me and says, hey, I'm going to try to get you out of here. I don't think you're okay. And I said, if you try to get me out of here, I will kill you. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so uh, in that moment, I felt, I was kidding, I didn't, I, 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 I felt true oneness with God. In my praying, I tried to bring myself to that level of reverence, uh, to remember who I am, whose I am, and before whom I am offering these prayers. It is an acknowledgement and then the third subdue, if you will, or doing, is, uh, is, is awe. It's an, another element of adoration. Awe is much like reverence, except it's, it's, a, it's a feeling in which we cannot truly comprehend the awesomeness of God, that sometimes all we are able to do is declare how awesome and awe-inspiring God is. It's when we have that speechless uncertainty that, that all those incidences in our lives that we were calling coincidences were actually God incidences, that he had put them in our lives to get us right to where we needed to be at the right time in the right place to make the right decision or to have the right conversation. It's an acknowledgement that, that even though we almost never realize it, we have these sudden bursts of epiphanies or insights that God has been guiding us and making all those misplaced and displaced moments fall into place so that we might be at one with the great mystery who is God. It is the, the moment, all, uh, is the moment where the Psalter says, what are human beings that you are mindful of us? Mortals that you would care for us. It's Psalm 8. It, it is these moments where all there is is the awesome nature of God and our spirit's acknowledgement of it. But we have to capture that in our praying, in our adoration. If you've ever had the chance to hike the Grand Canyon, uh, I've done it once. Two thirds of the way up, God gave me a gift. I turned around from one of the switchbacks and I looked at the vastness. I actually think two-thirds up is a better view from the very top because your eyes can't capture it all. The sight is really inexplicable. It's, it's too hard to describe with human words. It's that majestic and beautiful. And when I looked out into the canyon, God gave me a secret, a gift, and it was this. I am nothing. I have nothing. I am in the course of human history and in the breadth of all creation a little bitty speck of dust. I mean, if you think about all the billions of people who've walked this earth that God has created in all the places and in all the things, what am I? If all of human history was a beach, I'd be one little speck of sand in trillions of pieces of sand that make it up. If all of life in human history were a puzzle, the piece I am would be so small that if I were to hold it in my hand, I couldn't feel it or see it. And yet in that very same moment, I realized because God loves me, I have everything. Because God has saved me, while I may be on my own nothing, I am eternal. I am going to outlast this Grand Canyon. It's going to be long gone, and I will still be existing in the everlasting praise and worship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I am more significant and worthy than this canyon is because of God, because of His love and His salvation. This is all. This is all inspiring. This is where we say to God who is ever present, who is our creator and our sustainer and our savior, we are grateful. We revere you and you are awesome. Your grace is all inspiring. 
Your love for us is amazing. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. There is an ancient door available to each of us that you can turn and walk through with adoration. And if you walk through that door, if you're willing to daily adore him with gratitude and with reverence and with praise, with, with awe on your heart and in your mind and of your spirit, you can stand with Jesus Christ and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Be your name adored and revered. After all, that's how he taught us to pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As ushers come forward, let us continue to worship God with the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have blessed us in so many ways. And now, as we adore you and give back what is truly yours, give us cheerful and generous hearts. Take these gifts to further your kingdom and further the life of this church. Amen.
be seated. If you would like to follow along with the musical setting of the Great Thanksgiving, it is found on page 17 in your hymnals, otherwise printed in your order of service. Would you join me now as we give the Great Thanksgiving back to God? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacraments, fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to God and he gave it to you as disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Would the communion stewards please come forward as we sing the Agnus Day?
And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and lead, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, at the usher's invitation, you're welcome to come forward and kneel and to receive a piece of the bread and to dip it into the cup. This is a remembrance that God gave himself out of his own sacrifice from his son, Jesus Christ, to each of us. The invitation is to come in reverence, in awe of the amazing grace of God, to come in a spirit of adoration. All are welcomed here. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. It is Jesus' table. If you need gluten-free elements, please let one of the pastors know. And if you'd like to leave a gift here as an act of worship on the altar rail, it will be given to our In Christ's Name ministry that goes to take care of those who need care the most in our community. You are invited. The table is open. <laughs>
Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 528, Nearer My God to Thee. We will sing the first two verses of this hymn, verses 1 and 2. If there are those who wish to join our church by profession of faith, transfer from another congregation, or through the waters of baptism, you're invited to come forward as we sing, Nearer My God to Thee. Let us stand as we are able. Receive now this benediction. Go forth in the peace and in the knowledge that God is a God of all grace, of all power and majesty and mystery and goodness, and that our call is to worship and adore him. Go forth in a life of prayer, bringing gratitude and reverence and awe before his throne, and we will know greater peace. Thank you.